other people will still be coming. Um, as you just heard, uh, we'll be recording this session um, and as part of the pro larger project, which you'll hear about in a minute. It's really wonderful to have people from all over joining us um, to hear from our three incredible speakers and to be in conversation together. Um, please continue to introduce yourself in the chat room. Um, I want, I'm want i Linda Norris from the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, and I want to give a shout out to my colleague, Estefania, who's here handling all the behind the scenes things. Um, so thank you, Estefania, for that. Um, when you're not speaking, it would be great if you would mute yourself just so we can make it easy for everyone. And we'll be recording this session. Um, so that's all the kind of basics of what we'll be doing today. Um, and so next slide, Estefania. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that I come to you today from the traditional homelands of the Lenape people. Uh, in upstate New York. And to affirm uh, that each of us institutionally and personally can and should make commitments to learn more about indigenous communities, unsettle our own past learnings and work towards a more just future. At the coalition, we do that by working in partnership with indigenous communities, um, including as members, um, the National Residential School Museum in Canada, uh, is one of our important members. Um, we work with on um, projects where uh, more mainstream sites uh, begin to really work in partnership with tribal communities in how to reframe stories. We're working on a project in Arizona with the National Park Service right now. And projects like the one that we had the opportunity to work with Alex on that I, maybe you'll hear a little bit about later. But the process of um, this land acknowledgement is not only the acknowledgement, but an expression of our ongoing commitment to work with indigenous communities. Next slide. Some of you know Sites of Conscience, but some of you don't. So a very quick introduction. Uh, we are more than 350 members in 65 countries around the world. Uh, we started 23 or so years ago with um, Ruth Abram, the founder of the Tenement Museum in New York City, a place many of you may be familiar with, with the idea that maybe there were museums around the world interested in social justice uh, uh, museums and historic sites. Uh, we've been a global organization from the very beginning, um, and the sites are as diverse as you could imagine, everything from um, the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island to uh, Gulag CZ documenting the legacies of the Gulags in the former Soviet Union, District 6 in South Africa, Maison d'Esclave in Senegal, uh, and so many more. Um, you know, as you think about the work we do, we're brought together by one, sh a set of shared principles. Next slide. So our four principles and our organization, our own members are only organizations and they, we ask all our members to affirm this, that they interpret history through site. And site might be a place like a specific building, but it might also be a broad-based place like the Kigali Genocide Memorial interprets the history of the genocide in Rwanda that they engage members engage the public in programs that stimulate dialogue on pressing social issues. Um, they share opportunities for public involvement and positive action on the issues raised at the site and that they engage and act collectively as part of an interactive global movement to preserve memory, promote truth and pursue justice. So those four principles are no matter what histories we talk about, no matter where we are, in the world, these are the principles that animate us and our work together. And I should say, if you're interested in knowing more about the coalition, if your organization is interested in membership, we'd love to hear from you. Um, sitesofconscience.org is where you can find um, more about what we do and who we are, all those things. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, I'm going to turn this to Rebecca, I think, um, to talk about this over what this meetup is a part of. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Linda. Um, delighted to see so many people in the room today who haven't met before. Brilliant. And uh, people from all across the world just having a look in that chat. Um, yeah, a little bit background from me uh, before we start the main programme. I'm, I'm Rebecca Farley. I'm a senior research associate at Newcastle University working in the School of Arts and Cultures there. And I'm leading this um, overall networking project. And the, the se this session, our meetup today, is the second in a series of online virtual um, get-togethers, meetups that form one strand of an 18-month international uh, research project led by myself and Judith King, also at Newcastle University. And she's in the room somewhere, um, maybe give a wave. Um, in collaboration with our project partners. So in the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, who we're delighted to be working with on the project and, and uh, co-hosting with today. Um, the Artist Studio Museum Network, which is uh, mainly a European-based network of historic artist studio museums. Uh, Arts and Heritage, uh, which is a leading organisation in contemporary art and heritage here in the UK and National Trust, um, also one of our key UK partners. Um, the aim of the project, overall project, which is funded by the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council under their uh, international networking scheme, is to initiate a new research network which brings together curators and artists and heritage professionals and also academic in the UK and in Europe and, and globally to exchange and explore international and transnational understandings of contemporary art and heritage practice. So lots of different viewpoints in, in the room on that today. And our project started in August last year. It's an 18 month project running through to January, 2025. So under my estimation, we're kind of around halfway through that time already. And over the, over the period, as well as our planned meetups. As I said, this is the second, but we're doing two or possibly three more of those um, during the, the period of the project. We're also working with our partners to deliver a series of pilot virtual and transnational artists residences, um, which we're running with uh, four host sites um, over the summer. And we have two of those are in the uh, UK with the National Trust. We've got a host site, which is part of the Artist Studio Museum Network, and um, one host site, which is a member of the, the coalition. And alongside this, and building on our uh, previous, previous research at Newcastle, which Judith and I were both involved in, along with other colleagues, um, it's a, we are also running a small-scale mapping exercise, a kind of a scoping exercise, over the next few months to find out and start to build a picture of the scope of work in contemporary art and artist relationship with heritage um, internationally. So you'll probably be hearing more about that uh, in the next few months, a uh, few weeks. Uh, and support from our fa uh, fabulous project interns, Heidi and Dina, who are here with us today as well. Uh, we'll shortly be launching a new website to support the research project and we'll be putting some material from all the meetups on that site. So we'll hear more about that soon as well. Uh, in the meantime, if you've got any questions about the wider networking project, Judith and I uh, will be happy to answer those at the end of the meetup today if there's time, or please put um, you know, any questions in the chat and we'll kind of try and get back to you on those later on. Um, but now that's all for me on the wider project. I'm gonna pass you back to Linda who's going to introduce the session and our fabulous guest speakers. Over to you, Linda. Great, thanks, Rebecca. And um, we should say that this project um, with Rebecca and Judith is actually part of a larger partnership with Newcastle University, which is now, I think, three or so years old, um, in which we have done all kinds of different projects, including workshops for faculty, um, Newcastle supports, I think this coming in 2024, 25 interns at Sites of Conscience around the world, both virtually and in person, which has been 
kind of an amazing experience for host sites, but also uh, for the interns themselves. And we continue to develop more ways to work together. So this is um, the tip of the Newcastle ICSC partnership iceberg. Um, so to begin to think about co-creation, you know, it's not a very big term, but it really has a lot of different meanings. And I suspect it means different things to each of you here today. Our goal isn't to find a single definition, but to explore how co-creation works and what it means in different contexts and communities around the world. It's so exciting to have so many different people from so many different places and time zones. Also, thanks to you, those of you who are up early or staying up late in order, in order to be with us. But we really want to think about that. At ICSC, our work is deeply rooted in community. As you can probably tell from above, we're not a prescriptive network, but we're a network of shared values. And those values really come from community. Our, our work focuses more on how a process, um, any process, uh, empowers, impacts, and sometimes heals communities rather than the production of an artistic product. I'm sorry for the word product for artists, but that's the one I ended up with. It also means that our members in so many different ways interrogate many different issues of power and intersectionality <clears throat> through the lenses of community and artists working together. Who's called an artist? Who gets to decide whose story is told? What happens when a personal or community story is extracted for art by artists? How can we build equitable relationships with artists and communities, particularly when identities and lived experiences might be very different? Those are all kinds of questions and they really do revolve around these issues of power. Who gets to hold power? Who gets to hold power in what situation and when? And how can we learn from each other? So to be clear, I'm a practitioner, not a theorist. There are all kinds of useful and thoughtful writing out there that explore co-creation in more theoretical concepts. We'll share a list after the webinar of readings and websites we find useful. And if you have suggestions too, please feel free to put them in the chat um, for us all to learn from. If you're an artist, organization, or just an interested person, I hope you'll use this time to interrogate your own practices, to understand from your own view what co-creation means to you and how to ensure that however you approach it, that you under consideration always are the many complexities that it brings and the many potential rewards. So here's how today will work. I'm not gonna talk the whole time. Speakers aren't gonna talk the whole time. <laughs> um, I'll introduce our three speakers who will each give a brief overview of their work. After that, I'll have a couple of questions for them and you are probably gonna have questions as well. Feel free to put questions in the chat at any time. We'll keep an eye on those and um, ask them as well, but we'll also have a time you can raise some, some um, questions. After that, we'll split you into two rounds of small group discussions, coming back each time to reflect on our shared conversation. Then we'll have a wrap up with thoughts from our speakers. So it is so wonderful to have our three speakers here today. Um, their work is very different. Um, that's partly why we chose them to share their work with you. And I'll introduce all three at once and then we'll dive in. Um, so Sean Kelly oversaw all aspects of the visitor experience, including exhibits, events, visitor services, public programs and marketing at Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site in Philadelphia from 1995 to, 2000, to 2023. His groundbreaking work centered the voices and leadership of formerly and currently incarcerated individuals, including numerous art commissions. And he is, I guess, maybe he started yet. He's about to start. He's packing his house up. Um, is the new Vice President Visitor Programs and Services at Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy overseeing the conserv conservancies, exhibit public programs and visitor services throughout the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, including Alcatraz. Alex Panka Stock has the great privilege of being a painter and bead worker from the Gray Horse District of the Osage Nation. Her clan is the Panka Washtaj or gentle leaders. 
She's the third generation in her family to graduate from the Kansas City Art Institute and pursue the life of an artist. Her work is an investigation of community, culture, experience, and perception. She's dedicated her practice to elevating her Osage community and other indigenous groups in partnership with the Osage Nation Foundation, the Osage Museum, Illuminative, Pipestem Law Firm, ICSC, um, the National Endowment for Arts, and many others. Asif Imtiaz Tanu is an architect, designer, organizer, and artist with a diverse experience of work. Since 2018, he's been working in the Rohingya context with different organizations in Cox's Bazaar, the refugee camps. He designed child-friendly spaces. Um, and after finishing work, he was a product design consultant for the Rohingya Culture Memory Center. Uh, he's been coordinator of art and photography workshops and an exhibition. And he started working with ICSC uh, in 2021 and currently is working as project coordinator on the project Development of Community Arts Against Rohingya Genocide Implemented by Social Action of Voluntary Effort um, and supported by the coalition, our, our global initiative for truth, justice and reconciliation. So as you can see, three incredibly different um, people. And I will say I am running a little bit early. So Sean, I'm gonna let you go first. Go ahead and sh share your screen. You caught me off guard. Uh, yeah, give me a one second here. I'm going to pull this I'm up. sorry. I no, have a tendency to leave a lot no. of space and then run too fast. So that's... Oh, that's great. Let's let's do it. I'm okay. Set my timer here. We're on strict time. Hi, I'm Sean Kelly. Um, I'm currently uh, acting as a consultant. My firm is called Museums Can Do More. But as Linda said, I'm transitioning into the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy. Um, and uh, a lot of my work there will be on Alcatraz in partnership with the National Park Service. And I have to say that I've learned so much from the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. They have been with me throughout my career and every important thing I've done. So uh, it's a great honor to be here and also sharing this platform with um, two other extraordinary speakers. So thank you for the invitation, Linda. Um, I wanted to talk mostly just give some examples of the work. I worked at Eastern State Penitentiary for almost 30 years um, in Philadelphia. Uh, and during that time, I curated something like 120 art installations in this abandoned prison. Um, and I'm gonna come back to this at the end, but one of the questions that we, you know, the, the team at Eastern State and I were always asking ourselves was, whose voice are we representing? Um, whose Whose story are these things? And are those people in the room with us as we tell the stories? Um, and so I'll come back to that a little bit later, but I will say that the thing I'm most proud of during my time at Eastern State was under the leadership of um, Lauren Zalat, we began a fair chance hiring program where we um, hired people who are coming home from prison into the education department as full-time co-workers. And I'll come back to this at the end, but I'm enormously proud of it. It's not something we talked about a lot because the dynamics and the power structure get really weird when you start telling visitors that their educator may or may not have been formally incarcerated. And so we'll come back to this in a minute. But uh, originally we called it the Returning Citizen Tour Guide Project. So the early art program, when I started at Eastern State, there was already an art program um, that was moving forward, and there were 13 art installations the year that I started. I was the first Eastern State employee, but two curators, Todd Gillens and Julie Courtney, had raised money and put together an art program sort of separately from the plan to open the site. One of them was by Virgil Marty, and that's not him on the left, that's actually Oscar Wilde. Virgil recognized that Oscar Wilde was held in a prison modeled after Eastern State Penitentiary 100 years earlier to the year in 1895. And so Virgil... Um, Oscar, well, we'll get back to that in a minute. Virgil created a memorial for Oscar Wilde. That's Reading Jail uh, on the right. Um, it's To say these two buildings are similar is almost an understatement. So Virgil created a memorial for Oscar Wilde. Um, in the hallway, he put um, silk lilies because Oscar Well, I think Wilde like, you know, there's the mandatory stuff, which is more about demographics. And it's like, there's already a questionnaire for that. But then there's also- Can I ask I somebody to mute the, themselves? Look in, oh. Oh, thanks. Sorry, Sean. Okay. I thought that was a question for me. Um, Oscar Wilde famously um, uh, was photographed holding lilies. I'm realizing I'm running behind here. So um, Virgil made uh, wallpaper for Oscar Wilde 
uh, Oscar Wilde had a famous quote about um, wallpaper that either this wallpaper goes or I do. So we created wallpaper for Oscar Wilde and then made a memorial for him and allowed us to ask questions like what Oscar Wilde was held essentially for not denying that he was gay and was imprisoned with hard labor for that. And we would ask our visitors, what laws will our grandchildren find as morally repellent as this law from 100 years earlier? Um, and just opened up so many conversations. This is Elon Sandler's piece um, um, called A Rest about the murder of his sister. Um, he interviewed his parents and then made doors to the cell block about what it was like to lose a child to murder. This one says, I would like to know the person who did this is dead. Uh, I want to tell family members who did not know Simone about her strength and her goodness. We want to know why she was singled out. Was she just in the wrong place at the wrong time? We put together a review panel and began making this an open call uh, sometime in the early 2000s, and it continues that way uh, to this day. So here's some other of the early pieces that came in. This is Nick Cassway's Portraits of Inmates hey. in the Death Row Population, Sentenced as Juveniles. Um, he stenciled the faces of people awaiting execution for crimes they committed when they were children uh, onto plate steel, and then um, the steel would rust over time and then he would seal it when that person was executed. Um, I worked independently as a curator in Sinop, Turkey with the artist Ashley Hunt. And uh, I encouraged the whole team to go spend some time in an active prison. Uh, and so we went to visit a women's prison in Sinop in Turkey. Um, Ashley eventually filmed the sky up through a narrow um, tower and then projected it onto the ceiling of a, of a closed stairwell. It was extraordinarily beautiful. Um, Artist Troy Richards, uh, this is called The Criminal Us. Troy invited visitors to um, admit a time that they had committed a crime and gotten away with it, but then mix those confessions with the confessions of people who are currently incarcerated for their crimes. Um, and I'm very proud of this little detail. I suggested that he uh, that he uh, have a way of letting visitors know which is which. So if you push the button, you can find out whether the confession is from someone serving time for their crime or whether like you, they're just a visitor to the exhibit. And so it's sort of funny, but it also really gets at the at what we define, how we define criminality, what separates these confessions um, from each other. This is the artist, Jesse Crimes. He made the mural behind him while he was incarcerated in federal prison. It's 37 panels that he mailed home to himself. When I saw it pinned to the wall of the church, uh, where he had a studio. He'd been home for, I don't know, a month. And I had some very corny and literal ideas for how it could be exhibited at Eastern State, but Jesse's idea was much better. Jesse built a cell inside of a cell at the historic site so that you can actually step into his mural and be surrounded. And the last big project we did was called Hidden Lives Illuminated. We taught animation inside of prisons uh, for two years. Um, and uh, we taught storyboarding and storytelling, and then, then eventually the actual animation project. This is Quashim. He's working on a little flat light board to make his piece about his fight with cancer while incarcerated. Um, this is Brahim and Robert, and they're doing some stop action animation, me and Clarence. Uh, he's recording the soundtracks. Those are actually yoga mats. It's amazing what you can find in a prison. We paid the guys. Uh, well, there were also women in the program as well. We worked in two different prisons. I'm very proud, though, that we were able to actually get uh, the folks, the artists, paid for their work, which is very unusual in a Pennsylvania prison. And then we projected their films every night for a month on the outside wall of Eastern State Penitentiary so people could watch it from the street. We had about 4,000 people come see it. We projected from a coffee shop. We turned that into a dialogue space during the projections. And you could take a postcard, maybe make a little drawing on the front, look up which film was your favorite based on some still images, find out the name of the filmmaker, and then write a postcard and drop it in the mailbox. And we delivered 875 postcards back to the incarcerated filmmakers, who of course couldn't attend the screenings. Um, and it was my favorite part of the whole project. And I will say that these relationships have to be enduring if you spend this much time going into a prison. I was literally just emailing with people yesterday from this class. This is our class photograph. Um, and one of them, this is Jerome Loach, my good friend, who has been exonerated, came home, and now runs that program at Eastern State Penitentiary that brings people into the education department uh, who have been formerly incarcerated. And so I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but 
there can be a sort of an extractive quality and I've done it as much as anybody, but it's something you always have to fight um, is the, is the instinct to make these or the temptation to make these relationships transactional. And if you do this well, it really has to be an ongoing relationship that you're entering into. I'm a little over time. I'm going to stop there. And okay, Sean, you're great. And also <laughs> great being on time. Thank you. Um, uh -huh. I've had a chance to see some of those things at Eastern State. Some of you in the US may have had the opportunity as well. And they're pretty amazing. The films projected, I had forgotten that I had actually seen those. Um, Alex, I'm going to turn it over to you. We'll come back if you have questions for Sean, put them in the chat and we'll make some time for all of those. Um, but, um, Alex, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Sean. That was so powerful. Okay. I've got a video, so I'm going to share my screen. Hawaii. My name is Alex Ponka Stock. I'm a multimedia artist. I make paintings, utilitarian objects, sculptural devices, digital collage, adornment, performance art and poetry. I am from the Grey Horse District of the Osage Nation, a sovereign Indian nation located in North America, and I'm very grateful to be with you all. Today I'm sharing my experience with an installation that was on view from May 2023 through January 2024 at the Osage Nation Museum, the oldest tribally run museum in the United States. This monumental installation was comprised of two parts by two artists, myself and the profound Osage artist, Wendy Ponca, my mother. A little background. Wendy Ponca is an Osage textile artist and educator. She's the second generation in our family to graduate from the Kansas City Art Institute after my grandfather and grandmother, and I'm the third. Wendy then became a professor at the Institute of American Indian Arts in New Mexico for over 20 years. Teaching traditional techniques and fashion design, Wendy and her contemporaries paved the way for much of the success and recognition we're seeing in the realm of Native American fashion and design today. She lives and conducts her art practice from our studio on the Osage Reservation in the area of Northeast Oklahoma. The 2023-24 collaborative work at the Osage Nation Museum was initiated by Wendy's installation piece titled The Seven Bends in the River of Life. The piece's central focus is a very old Osage symbol of the same title. The symbol represents the pathways, ups and downs, challenges and joys of a full, well-lived life. The installation was pure white silk, which expressed itself into the room like a waterfall from the ceiling. Flowing onto a black platform, the symbol, the seven bends, moved into the viewer's space, a dynamic visual designed for contemplation, further encouraged by the accompanying black church pews on either side of the platform. The light in the room was highly manipulated and the sound of water immersed the experience in even further meditative ambiance and encouragement. Midway through the life of the installation, my work titled Renaissancing the Osage, was unveiled alongside my mentor and mother's. The works measuring around seven meters wide by three meters tall are oil paintings in the tradition of altar works and triptychs of the European Renaissance era of painting. While the seven bends focus on minimalist color and design, the paintings introduced in the installation contained saturated color depicting modern Osage models from the Grey Horse community set in compositions and scenes referencing the work of European masters. The ornate tapestries and moldings typical of traditional Renaissance painting gave way to Osage motifs of ribbon work and our cosmological origins in the marriage of the sky and earth people. The figures present in the paintings are an Elampa, or the firstborn son, a Madonna, and an elder. 
This representation of powerful points in a person's life echoed sentiments of the Seven Bends. The dialogue between the works highlights the sacred cycles and eras in a person's experience on this earth. While my work intends to exalt the glory, grace, and beauty of contemporary Osages within Western paradigms, Wendy's work shows the compassion and generosity of, of allowing space for whatever a person is or is feeling and experiencing. Exultant, yes, but also in grief or fear or hardship. All these things, the good and bad, are part of a full life lived, each element parts of the seven bends we must traverse. This concept is poignant in the life of an individual as well as a people or a community, something which was ex especially important during the exhibition, as our tribe has been rehashing an extreme and traumatic era in our history through the release of the motion picture Killers of the Flower Moon, which was produced and shot on our reservation. Wendy expressed the hope, which I second, that the space was a reprieve or healing experience for people to express, address, and integrate the trauma being showcased on the world stage. And the response from our community has been humbling. I'll end by saying that I'm just so grateful to have had this experience, to have worked so closely throughout the process with Wendy Ponca and our museum's visionary director, Marla Redcorn Miller. I think that art is a mystery and metaphor, and especially in times of challenge or suffering, we can communicate things with art that are not easily understood or said. And we are best, and our work is best, in the service of others. Wei Wana, thank you so much for your time and attention and all your work in the realm of art. Okay, so that's the video. Um, see if I can get out of here. And I, I think I'm pretty close to time. So you've got a couple more minutes if you've got. Do yeah. I? Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I think I just, um, you know, I, when I got to going on this presentation, it just really made me start to think about, um, Gener generational aspects of communal art. And I think that in the Western sphere of fine art, often those generational uh, relationships are not as respected. There's kind of a rugged individualism. And in my community, there are so many examples of that uh, generational practice. And so that's definitely been my experience. And I wanted to really highlight that, that my family and my community has made those pathways for me and we support those things. So I, I'm just really grateful for that. And I think that there's a real important point there to nurture, especially in communities that experience uh, mass violence or, you know, those, connections can be cut off and I think then are especially important to nurture. Um, so, yeah. I, uh, yeah. That's, a, that's a really important uh, point, Alex, about those kind of family and community together. So um, uh, thank you. Um, and, and as always, if you have questions for Alex, sorry, I set my timer. Uh, if you have questions for Alex, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and Tanu now over to you. Uh, thank you, Linda. Like, I'd like to thank at the beginning, uh, uh, to give me this platform, like of talking and, uh, I'm gonna. I'm an architect, uh, an artist, like working for this uh, Rohingya refugee community uh, for, for like almost like five years, and uh, I am now. I'm about to share like about the project I'm doing right now. Like uh, it's called like Community Arts Against Rohingya Genocide uh, in Bangladesh, and uh, as you see, like the project. Uh, aims for like it's a part participatory method like uh, of different creative methods to chronicle the memory and the experiences of genocide basically endured by the Rohingya community and the goal is to document and like disseminate the truth uh, about the genocide to feed the justice seeking process 
while he's galvanizing the community in pursuing their future aspirations as well. So in this uh, sensitive process of work, like uh, as it is like a research and participatory method, like of work. So we, we segmented it in like six uh, steps and major steps. Uh, training of the art facilitator. So we have a, like a team of Bangladeshi art facilitators and also Rohingya counterpart. So training of the art facilitator is the key. And then skill mapping through creative potential. Like So you have to find out the right people. And the storytellers, uh, mm -hmm. as it is a storytelling project, you are collecting the truth, uh, collective voice. And then uh, engage them in the truth-telling process, uh, basically participating and facilitate them uh, to explore their arts, their culture, and the stories behind uh, the genocide, the oppression, uh, like the experience throughout a longer timeline. And then the capacity building of the art artisans, like if it is necessary, we do uh, necessary workshops to improvise techniques and methods of like work so that they can produce the goods and hands-on workshop finally to produce the outcomes like that they give and final stage is documentation and mm -hmm. dissemination. And as it is a like a um, participatory method and a way of approaches, like the first key here is to like building the trust. Like, so we did uh, trust building exercises, like, and also we called it personalizing the space to, uh, to connect all the stakeholders, like in different levels and uh, to create an ownership of the like participants there. And as uh, the individual artists, as we have like art facilitators in our team, like uh, and the projects have been led by them. And individual art -led, artist led project is uh, through this like shapes, like uh, mapping the community, then like creating a safe space, then trust building, and then sharing the stories. Uh, you know, it's, it's a modular process of work, so you can implement it like with any particular group of people. And then finally, collaboration with the storytellers and artists and to express themselves uh, through arts and crafts. So a few of the projects I'm going to share here uh, because I have like we have like a lot of like things to share. But like uh, as the starting of the project, like we started with the pre-genocide stories, because when you're working with genocide and like sensitive stories, you cannot like push a human being just into uh, talking about their like sufferings and trauma. So what we did at the beginning uh, we started working with their festivities and uh, the, what are the celebrations they have. This is the embroidery work. It has been done uh, by the people. And uh, it's mostly women. There is an important factor as well as the Rohingya community is like really conservative. So we have to like separate ma male and female participation separate at the beginning. And uh, then In Search of Fruits is a similar kind of process project like where you're going to see the reflection of their like cultural uh, like aspects the festivities like what they do like uh, in the regular life as it is like an agricultural based like uh, experience they had before and then this is one of the important project we have done like uh, it's called fire fear frustration like a uh, fire is pro portraying uh, the brutality and, and the violence like of the genocide then fear is going to talk about the like the memories uh, of the horrified journey when they escape like uh, and across the border and across the river and come towards uh, and seek help in Bangladesh. And first session is uh, we call like the camp life. It's a, like a, quite a big, big canvas. Uh, it's 10 feet 9 inch by 7 feet 2 inch. And uh, the genocide day is portraying like what happened to them. And then the fear is basically the cross-border journey. As I told you, the first session is a, is a camp life here. And uh, then, then this project is called like phases of genocide, like where like uh, ten male participants and ten female participants like uh, collectively draw the experience, and it's a, it's a, a kind of timeline we are seeing because like some of the people are, were like in back in two thousand seventeen, then uh, then the stories came back from like eighties or nineties, so you can find it in the details on all these paintings. And these are also like very big size uh, uh, canvas, and this this one is done by uh, ten female participants, like the similar way they participated, and they saw like a river when blood, like when the 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 Myanmar military killed these people, like and cornered them in a village. And then uh, this is this one is another interesting one, like we developed in, in, like, in a from a song. It's a form of a song, and it's called Puthi, like that is like a traditional. Uh, the folk folklore uh, thing uh, like in the in this Rohingya community 
and uh, he's also participated by like the Rohingya youth, but the stories have been collected by this old man, like a storyteller, basically. And you can see the systematic operation, like they have, like when, when they wanted to get married, even like they have to bribe this community, or if they wanted to give a bond, or they they they're they're taking their domestic uh, animals to suffer, they have to like give charge to these people. Uh, and then uh, this one is called like reflection of resilience, and it's done by like the women group, uh, like in Camp Two East, and uh, this is like portraying like what happened while they're like. Uh, they have this genocide moment and uh, this one is a reflection of resilience uh, this uh, this is actually the future aspiration what what they want in their life like uh, so they drew their like dreams like they want universities they want like schools they want like playground as they basically they want like the dignified repatriation they want to go back uh, this memorial memoir of genocide is uh, uh, done by like Yel Water Chajo. Like it's a like traditional hand fan, but also like it's telling the story of the genocide of like different people. Uh, and uh, this is portraying also their cultural heritage, like what, what is lost there. So both male and female participants like uh, stitch these like beautiful words. And this one is also like about their... Uh, uh, poster we call it poster of rights it's a like pin making uh, process uh, where, where they're claiming their like future uh, the rights basically like over here and uh, project spotlight this is a very uh, important one of the Rohingya genocide because it's based on uh, the Tula Tuli village it's one of the significant village where the they brutally kill the village people as you can see in the painting the houses are burning and the military people they cornered cornered this group of uh, villagers and they like ma mass killed them like and shook them and they saw the river like went like completely red like and blood shaded like while these things happened and uh, this one is uh, another interesting project and it is called eyes that witness genocide as we when we are like interviewing some of the some of the genocide victim people uh, so from from their perspective, like what we see is like a human being cannot be the same while they face some kind of oppression or genocide or so many negative things happen while they are like taking shelters in a different country as a like refugee. So they they we we photograph them and then they cut this photograph and they make it again uh, in a way that uh, they have these uh, like weaving patterns and they make try to make this photograph again reform it. But as you see, like some of the parts are not being same, which is symbolizing like after these incidents happen, a human being cannot be the same as as there are the stories they, they drew, like how he lost his eyes or what happened exactly uh, while they experienced this trauma. And this is another project is uh, we call it like memory mapping, like uh, we, we so far we talked about like collective memories and now we are trying to talk about like individuals and their sufferings, both male, male and female participants were engaged in this process. And they shared like how they got like oppressed and like how their family members got kidnapped, like they killed them and they got attacked by the Myanmar military. And uh, this is also like a body mapping, uh, it's called bruises of genocide, as you can see, like the way of working, like the people are uh, coming forward, like to share these stories like to us and they're participating in this, in this method. And, uh, this project is particularly uh, we're emphasizing here like women and genocide like what happened because women uh, in this context is very sensitive they don't want to like uh, come in front of the male dominating like society like they don't want to like participate in any kind of thing so it's really sensitive for them to come and participate in this process of work uh, but like uh, here it is it is portraying as a woman like, like as a sister as a mother um, what they experience like if you go in the detail of this like memory quilt like you can see their like sufferings in an individual scale and uh, this is uh, another interesting one we call it like missing numbers uh, this box is called Kunduk in it's a it's a treasure box like uh, it's a cultural heritage like a part like of the Rohingya people and uh, what we did is like we collected the stories from them and like put the stories so that you can like roll it and like read uh, about their families, what happened to them and uh, why it is there. And uh, 
as a part of this project, like we uh, we created like uh, two community teams, like which is called like Life Still Happen and Crops of Solidarity, and it is a collaboration with Historians and Kilometers, and uh, in a, we work in like it's a like co-creation, like everything we are seeing here is like co-creation. It's like a parallel contribution of the Rohingya and Bangladeshi counterpart, and everybody work here like parallelly. As you can see in different like pictures, uh, we are shooting them, like trying to show them in the government like offices, and uh, so that we are working in the fields. Uh, so these two films uh, we produce um, uh, through this timeline of the project. I can I can share the links as well, like so that you can see it like later on. And as a part of like the most important part of like uh, of our project is like to disseminate it like in the camp level, like so that like people are connected. And people knows what happened to them. As a matter of fact, like as they're living inside of the camp, like most of the people started like forgetting what they experienced before. But like it's not a matter of fact, like that, like they they should forget this information. So when we disseminate this, like there was a like a that that creates a dialogue like in between the community and with us, like and they started like sharing more stories. The people are coming more forward and like. Uh, uh, they're like basically ice breaking with us and like sharing more and uh, informations and they and through this process they knew that like this is gonna help their um, justice seeking process so they feel forward uh, to contribute in this process also another important fact here uh, we have to notice that like Rohingya culture is not really a culture where you can see a lot of diverse art form uh, as you as most of the people they praise five times and uh, but still they participated in this beautiful creation of works just because we we this is a collective voice and when a voice is like collective it is so powerful so that it can uh, be spread and it can be impacted in different levels uh, of work and finally we are we are doing an exhibition it's an ongoing one uh, uh, we are doing it in a liberation war museum so from this project, like what we're trying to do is to like create an impact, create an awareness amongst the country uh, and globally. Uh, so the, if the exhibit is, is basically reflecting their systematic oppression and atrocities uh, that led to the forced migration in Bangladesh. And it aims to, uh, uh, it aims to tell the genocide victim stories beyond borders and build awareness of the human right among global citizens and hoping for the dignified repatriation and non-recurrence of such crimes against the humanity. So we called it like a long journey, uh, Rohingya longing for their homeland. And uh, uh, we are disseminating it like, we, it has a like thematic segments of like work, like as you, start, you will start from the cultural heritage part and the systematic operation you're gonna see, and then it will go intensely into the work of like, like the trauma and the uh, experiences that they have already with them. And uh, I'm giving a glance of this project at the end. Like we we have like uh, 10 camps. We are working in 10 camps uh, and we have like six centers. And from this mapping uh, mapping method, like we have more than 6,000 storyteller artists and artisans who are on the list and we can work with them. We, we, we facilitated like more than 800 uh, meetings with the, uh, to find the community artists and the people who, who has the story. Storyteller means here directly the genocide victim people. And uh, right now we currently are working with 310 beneficiaries, uh, participants uh, in, in different forms of art and methods. And uh, we have like a strong psychosocial support as well, like as we are working with like trauma and gen like genocide. So we, we have like these two counselors like who, who continuously giving uh, counselings on them. And uh, we have 40 Rohingya youths who we call them like Rohingya art facilitators. We have like uh, eight Bangladeshi artists. Uh, six of them are like from art and architecture background and two of them are like filmmakers producing different kind of uh, work with this community. And uh, we produce uh, so far two community films. We call it RR production, like as it is a, as a Bangladeshi and Rohingya both uh, combination of the work. And so far we have done six level camp level exhibitions and uh, one national level exhibition. And as you as you see, like uh, we have like a lot of learning uh, from this process of like co-creation because uh, engagement, community engagement, collaboration, empowerment, and uh, mutual understanding like of this both community Bangladeshi we are working and the Rohingya part as well. And this is it is a process of like intense um, 
iterative uh, process because we we have to like learn and like immediately take decisions and like adapt the decisions and work accordingly to find a like right way because this process was not been founded like before and like through this timeline of work we 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 found this method of like work like basically and uh, there are like a lot of like impacts as you can see like the breaking the social stigma is like one of the major factor here and then psychosocial healing, uh, we have like, we are offering them a, a safe space because until or unless you are offering them a safe space, they will not like uh, express themselves. You cannot find their like true uh, informations. Uh, then we are continuously building up their capacities so that like they are, the community is getting empowered and women empowerment is another significant factor like in this process and leadership building. Through our uh, art network volunteer, like the art facilitators, we are like uh, building their leadership and uh, documenting the truth. Actually, the whole process is documenting the truth in this method of work. So uh, it is a like peer learning for the both uh, Rohingya counterpart and the Bangladeshi part to how to document like truths in in a such a beautiful creative way. And uh, peace building. This is a kind of because we are we are Bangladeshi people working for this project and engage with this community it's a like a way of peace building in between the host community and the Rohingya community as it is a beautiful process of like art uh, artwork and it's a kind of art therapy like uh, so these people are getting emotionally resilient like as they are living inside of the camps they have like faced like so many things and then uh, in terms of like challenges, we have like a lot of challenges faced uh, to produce this work, like psycho, psycho, uh, psycho, psychological challenges are like the first one we, we experience because revisiting the memories is like a trauma and like it's a trauma for both of us and them as well. So we, we have to like deal this uh, work like very sensitively. Then like political power, like a, pol a very complex power dynamics and politically unstably. Uh, work was like really one of the major challenges in in this work and then cultural uh, cultural challenge is another another important challenge understanding and like coping up with this culture and like different language is like a was a great challenge for, for us but like which we overcome through this media of like art because art can be so powerful that you don't have to learn any other language through this mechanism you can like media of art like you can express yourself and uh, Time restriction is another like great challenge because truth telling and healing process it takes a while like to work. But as we as you can see like we we, we have this project timeline just one and a half year, so that was a like important challenge for us. Uh, then accessibility in the camps is another great challenge because you cannot like move freely from one camp to another camp. And infrastructure wise, it is really because it is really hard to find a place because when you're working with this community and like gathering of a community is happening all the time, uh, it is important like to have a like nice place. But unfortunately, we do, didn't have uh, a lot of flexibility of getting like large spaces. So we, we work like most of the places we have is like maybe 12 feet by 18 feet maximum. And we manage these big size works even inside of the scams. So like, this is what I'm doing uh, from this project uh, and, and thank you very much. Thank you, quite amazing. All three of you, really um, incredible work in such a different ways. It's really wonderful to see. Um, I, I, there's lots of questions in the chat and people may have more questions. Um, I have a question and there's a lot of practical questions, but I have a question maybe that's not quite so practical, which is how do each of you in your own way manage the sorrow and joy in these projects? Because all three projects seem to have both elements of that, right? There's the joy of creation and the joy of community, but also in some way, all three of them are about things that are also about sorrow. And I'm just curious in your own way, sorry to leap in with like, not the practical question, but a big question. Um, how do you, like, do you think about that? How do you take care of yourself? I'm just opening that up to the three of you. I had the same question. Um... No fair, Sean. I know, but I was going to put it in the chat, but I, I had the exact same question of, of how people, I'm really curious to hear from my um, fellow presenters. 
I have never been incarcerated and I've always, um, the experience of joy and connection has always so completely overwhelmed the sense of sorrow and outrage and injustice, which also comes with the work. Um, but, um, I really would actually, I, I would love to hear my other panelists address that. I, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have a greater answer for that. Okay. Please. <laughs> Alex Tanu, what do you think? I, well, I think I mean, personally, and... <laughs> please Tanu, you go. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Like I'll, I'll speak later. I, I, I think personally, you know, when you, when you're immersed in these situations or these or cultures who have or 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 sectors of society that have a lot of trauma i think that you get really in order to survive and not carry bitterness there's there has to be a certain amount of understanding that you can be big and small at the same time and I think that this othering, which ends up in all this suffering in human life, is a is a meta, it's a it's a magnification of the othering we do in ourselves, and that is to say that you know that oh I only want joy and there can't be any suffering or or that's or I'm not living life right or or trying to reject that suffering. And especially when you go through trauma, you know, a lot of times you really block it out. And I think making peace with the fact that this life is a mix and we have to understand that and that you don't get one without the other. And I think then that reflects on a larger scale too, for me anyway. I mean, uh, for me, like, uh, it is really hard to like make a balance, like, uh, because especially in, when you're like going inside of the camps camps is a, is a place like you will so i'm working like since like 5 years in the camp right now like and i had a research like on the rohingya culture as well like before so like to be very honest now i am being very resilient like working with this community and also like i have uh, developed my own mechanism like how i'm going to preserve myself a little bit as well as like take care of my colleagues because it is impacting everybody and it is so intense that that except for getting like merged with this community you won't get the, like the success you won't get the like results like that you are desiring for so the beauty of this process what what gives me uh, like a little bit of a balance like i think when you are engaged with this process with the community like and even though you are working with trauma but when these people they never like draw a little like like drawing like they never like touch colors so when you see this like like joy and like bright light on their eyes like that that gives you like hope and like a balance like of your like mentally like what i would what, what i can say like this is interesting and like important uh because those those small details are the inspiration of this work like because you you, you will understand that you are working for this humanity like no matter what the conditions are like you are working for them and when you see this like little smile on their face because you will see like the baby they're carrying the women's are carrying babies and they're drawing people like and keep the baby behind they don't have a place to breastfeed because it is so congested and like you are like so compact like working with like 10 15 people at the same time it is not a like really pleasant experience but even though like when when they came to know when you are seeing these people are having like really interesting uh, participation, especially in terms of when you are introducing them different medias, different different uh, method of work, like and especially when they are like not not artists, but you are improvising their thoughts in like a beautiful way, so they can draw anything. Maybe it can, it can be it will look like childish, but that is the beauty of the, that like impression that they are expressing. They're being able to express themselves. So I think like that gives us a, like a, a really nice balance. And like, for me, it is a really great inspiration when I, I see them. And uh, I'm also, I feel strongly that like through this way of work, they're getting empowered because like, they're like deprived from everything, everything. They're not getting education. They're not getting any technologies, devices or networking. 
So when we are introducing them like devices, we are introducing them like techniques where the youths are getting understanding how to document, how, uh, as we were, we were talking about, like we produce two community frames. So they produce the community frames with, with the mobile phones because in the camps, you cannot like give camera or like devices like uh, in this community people. So when you are like giving them like whatever they have, like through a digital phone, they are like started capturing the moments, what they experience. And uh, they're getting, getting excited about it. They're keen to learn. And you will see the potential of this community. Like if you treat them well, give them enough facilities, how great that this potential energy can be. Great. Thank you. That's terrific. So I want to go to a couple questions that are in the chat. A question for Sean. Um, was there ever ret retinous, reticent from the incarcerated people to be involved in these projects? In other words, like for the, the filmmaking, um, how did you choose people and how did people choose? How did that work? Um, the Department of Corrections chose the group for us. In fact, I had some acquaintances in, in one of the prisons uh, who I knew were really interested in art, and none of them got into the class because the Department of Corrections chose the class for us. And many of the people in that class had never experienced or had tried to draw or create anything visual before. And so we worked with the group that the Department of Corrections um, uh, chose for us people of course signed up for the class so uh, the fact they were in the class meant they were interested in, in learning about animation and making a film about their lives um, so there wasn't reticence in the beginning but you know real real talk the dynamics of the class got really complicated um the class was 18 the we did most of the work in a men's prison we had a because of the way that prisons are laid out in the United States it was very difficult for us to work in a women's prison here located in Philadelphia because there, there isn't a state prison for women that's near enough. So it was very complicated. We ended up working in a county prison for women and it changed the whole nature of the women's uh, project because people in, in county prisons cycle in and out so quickly that we couldn't, no one, none of the women in the project could finish a, a film because they were never in that facility long enough to finish a film. So that's a story unto itself. But um among the men, um, there were 18 men of color and two white men. And I'm a white guy. I'm just, I never know how to talk about this stuff. So I'm just talking about it. If I'm not using my words carefully enough, by all means, tell me in the chat if, if you think I should be phrasing things differently. But just real talk, the, the dynamics of that. And then I had told the Department of Corrections that we would only make films about routines. And honestly, I was saying that in part because I didn't want to go down the road of people in the program wanting to make films about their grievances against the Department of Corrections, which you might imagine were plentiful and seemed quite valid to me in many cases, but I also knew the Department of Corrections would never allow it. And so I told the DOC that we would write films about routines and you know, immediately the guys in the class were like, why would we want to write about routines? That's like the last thing on earth that we want to talk about. Actually, that's not true. Three or four of the guys actually did in the end, but people want to write about their families. They want to write about their experiences. And that led to a whole process of the Department of Corrections censoring the work. And I was not in a position to fight. Um, I, I just wasn't in a position to to. I had zero leverage with the Department of Corrections. It was like, this is what you have. Either you work around our limitations about what the guys can write about, or you can pull the plug on the project. Those are the choices. And so we had some really honest conversations about that with the group. And um, Christina May, who goes by Starfire, was our storytelling coach and really saved the project and came in and said, you know, guys, you can't write the exact story that you want to write, but you can write a story that's beautiful and meaningful. And and she started talking about metaphor. And a lot of the guys wrote really specific films about what they wanted to talk about, but they wrote it through metaphor and through example rather than literally, this is how I feel about my specific grievance against the Department of Corrections and against my trial judge or, or those kind of stories, which are just never going to fly. But it was very tense. About six months into the project, I really wasn't sure we would come out the other side of it. And um, Starfire really got us focused on how you can tell these stories, even within this environment that controls 
literally what you can say. And um, every single person in that class, we did a bunch of anonymous surveys in the end. I know that every person in that class made a film they were proud of. It may not have been the film they started out to make, but they made a film they were proud of. And incidentally, um, uh, and I'll stop yakking here in a second, but um, if you want to see, did I just share my screen? I think I did. Um, if you want to see the films, there are the films that they're at hiddenlives.org. There are 20 films, um, 19 films by incarcerated men and um, and one film by a team of incarcerated women because they were cycling in and out. And they're lovely, every last one of them. They run about between 60 and 90 seconds, which is a lot in animation. A commercial is 30 seconds long. I mean, you can really tell a lot in 60 seconds. And um, they were, every one of them is poignant and lovely and beautiful. And it, I was just so proud to see them projected we had a 35,000 lumen um, projector, something that you'd use at a rock concert to project it onto that wall. Someone asked in the chat how it's paid for. All of our, our programs are paid for by Eastern State Has a Haunted House, uh, something I've, I had mixed feelings about from the beginning to the end of my time there. Um, but the Haunted House generated a lot of revenue and that revenue in part paid for the art program, except for that filmmaking project, which was paid for by the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage. Thanks, Sean. Oh, yeah. So much to dig in, and I hope people go watch the films. Tanu, a question for you about participants as well. Um, how did you yeah. find participants? And do the participants get to decide what kind of form their artwork will take? Or like, how did the form of artwork, which are so many and varied, and participants, how do those match up? Yeah, thanks for the question. It's a really interesting question. Um, so like uh, the process of work, like we have after training of the art facilitators in the Rohingya camp, we send them uh, inside of the camps to find like a like the storytellers, people who knows already like uh, to uh, like swing or like uh, the kids like or somebody is interested to learn like drawing or artwork, a very basic thing like. And then from those like a list of the people, what we do is like, Right at the beginning, we call for a general meeting and we the, on this general meeting, like maybe 40, 50 people participated and we do a, like a, a test run basically. And we, we see because like uh, it, it's a matter of co-creation because we are not imposing them any ideas of what they want to produce or what they want to do. So we offer them like uh, we ask them for their stories. So who like on the base, basis of the stories and the people who are really keen to participate, like we choose a group basically. That's how we like, choose the participant right at the beginning. And from there, like we have like a method of working because one group of people can come to the center like uh, once in a week. So in this week, like we, we designed this like weekly basis, like work with them. So first shape after the, this general meeting is uh, basically discussing, brainstorming and like forming the idea of what they want to do actually. Will it be a, like a painting? Will it be like a just a piece of drawing? Or if they want to like do a like embroidery or like a quilt, like whatever the knowledge they have, because like people, a lot of organizations is working inside of the camps and they have the glance of the like the work also, like what they can produce. So we, we didn't impose much like on those things at the beginning. Great. Um, so many great questions, and we probably don't have time to get to them all. Um all three presenters I know are happy to answer questions via email or whatever. I'll, I didn't ask them yeah. that, but I'll just assume that. Um, yeah. And we'll share email contacts. But for now, what we're going to do is actually break you all into groups and the, um, you know, the presenters will join you as well. Uh, and what we're going to do, we're going to give you a couple of prompt questions um, to think about. But then we're going to ask you in your group to also add some of your group thoughts onto the a padlet and if you oh i just sent it to sean directly and not to anyone else let me try that again um click on this link i just put in the chat it opens up to something called a padlet i don't know whether any of you have used them before but basically you can by just putting Clicking on the lower right hand corner, there's a little plus sign. It pops up and you anyone can type and share their thoughts. You can see I just did one. Um, super easy to use. 
So what we're going to do, you're going to be in breakout rooms for about 10 minutes while you're thinking about these questions and also, I hope, introducing yourself to each other. Um, feel free to put some thoughts in on the Padlet and then we'll come back and reflect upon them as a big group. Make sense to everyone? Well, I can't see any of you. So if it doesn't make sense, let me know. Or if you're having problems accessing the Padlet, let me know. Everybody okay? All right, Stephania, can you put folks into groups? Sure can. Okay, I'm going to be sending you all off. Everybody knows how to go to a group, yeah? Yes, I'm assuming. You'll get an invitation, accept it, and you'll be in a room with people. And then about how long are you expecting people to be in rooms? 10 minutes. Ten minutes. All right. Sorry, everyone. Oh, Stephania, can I make a request? Um, can I go to the other group? Because two people in our organization are already on that group. Oh. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Which group are you in? Um, so that was two. In group two? All right, let me move you on out. Thank let you. I'm so sorry. Thank you for letting us know. <laughs> Thank you, George. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Stephanie, is everybody back? Yeah, we have everyone. Okay. I see you all were slightly reluctant padlet users. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's just, I'd love to reflect a little bit on what you talked about in your groups. Anybody want to share what their group talked about? Just kind of unmute yourself or go ahead. I'll go first, Linda. We, Thanks, we Judith. Did, uh, we did find ourselves knowing uh, three of us knew each other uh, because we were, <laughs> we were grouped together randomly, but we were so interested to hear about Melissa and the work that she was doing in Alaska um about how so i'm i'm so sorry we didn't we didn't stick to your rules at all we just found out about <laughs> about melissa and her museum and it, it was just fascinating uh as to how um melissa's here now but uh, how she works with contemporary art practice in a in a different way to the work the way that we're doing in in the uk here um so i'm afraid our, our conversation went went focused that's on that. okay we wanted um, to I just, find out <laughs> I just want to say, Kathy, you couldn't get the Padlet to work. And did and other people have that problem? So just as a reminder to everybody, there's a little circle with a plus sign at the bottom right hand corner of the Padlet. You know, you're looking at it on your own computer, not through Zoom. And you click on that little circle with the plus sign and something will open up that you can add um, things, which I see some people you are are doing. Anybody else want to share? Um, oh, right. See, now we can see that some people are writing. That's great. Um, anybody else want to share what they talked about in their group? I'd like to share something. Sure. I am telling my group that I had been creating artwork about enslaved people and free people of color in America as far as African people um you know in time periods that are no longer here and so when the question of like who are you co-creating with I was having a hard time because I was thinking like you know I just spent a lot of time thinking about the people or reading education about people or like little mini series or like fictional books too and Alex Alex you say it, like Alex she was like, you know, I think that's like a really valid point of co-creation is, you know, within inner thought and, you know, trying to connect to people who are no longer here. And uh, with the last question about, you know, who are we looking to connect to, it's nice to know that there are people who are con creating contemporary art that is 
taking the space for like different historical spaces and knowing that that's out there is pretty cool. So when you say taking the space for different historical spaces, uh, tell us more what you mean. Yeah, like to know that contemporary art has a space within historical spaces. I feel like historical spaces, there's so much about preserving what was there, but the whole idea of why we're talking about history now is there, there's been things that we were not taught or different perspectives that you know we're trying to figure out. So when I'm working in historical houses, and people come and they're looking for the same opulence that you know was there before. If we're changing the focus and we're talking about people who had been enslaved or humanized in the space, like it's really important to have contemporary thought in the same spaces, or you're gonna have you know some of the same issues. Great, thanks. Anybody else have want to share what they talked about in their room before I have more questions for all of you? Any other thoughts? We uh, we talked about basically like the work we have, like I have done like and in our group, like so far, like we couldn't go through all of this. <laughs> uh, there was like a lot of questions. Uh, so <laughs> we are kind of like responding <laughs> like those. Things. Great. And I can see you're also answering questions in the that chat speaker. So yeah. uh, thank you both. Um, okay, we're going to do another round with more questions and a different Padlet, this time featuring a piece of Alex's work. Um, and so we'll send you back again to think about, you know, these questions. Why does co-created work matter to artists, to organizations, to communities, like why should we be doing this work? Um, to also think about why, um, you know, what it, you know, why does it matter? What are we doing? How can we do it better? And who else would you like to hear from um, about this work? So here's the, here's a new Padlet. I know you all can give it a try. Um, Padlets are also a great record for us in projects to kind of continue our thinking. Uh, Stephanie is, I believe, gonna put you back in the same rooms, right? Because now you know each other uh, and now you have 10 minutes. Um, again, feel free to go back to um, other questions, but this we hope is just a time for you all to have some good conversations together. Okay, off to your rooms. Sending you off right now. Great, everybody. We always think that you must be having good conversations that when you get the closing in a minute, you don't come back right then. So, because we have had that happen. So uh, hopefully they were great conversations. Um, anybody want to share what they talked about in their group this time? Feel free to just un- I, know, I nominate Judith to talk about our group. <laughs> Oh, I, I was going to say, Melissa, I, I was going to say something about our group as well. How We, we, we actually um, took something that Jemima, you were saying just before, I think. You were talking about that, about the idea of co-creation and co-creation with the past. And I thought that was a really interesting, so it's not about necessarily co-creation with other people in the present and working with, but looking back at, yeah, you were saying about, um, so it might be a historical collection of objects, but thinking of, through that in a, in, a, in a contemporary way. I thought that was really interesting. Just that I like that, I, that, that whole phrase about co-creation with the past seems to very much fit the way that um, kind of contemporary art and heritage has started to work in, the, in our kind of UK context, working with people like organisations like our National Trust, who look after landscapes, but also lots of 
historic collections and um, historic country houses and things. And there's been a lot of work uh, here in the UK around that. It seems to be quite, a, that's now kind of quite a normal practice about bringing contemporary artists into those spaces and responding to them. And then the question that we didn't get to in our group, but I wanted to just open up is about how, what difference that then makes to the visitors to those places, that those visitors are experiencing are looking at that kind of history and heritage through a contemporary lens, a, a new take on that. So that's a question for all of you who particularly, I see a number of you who uh, work with sites that actually have visitors. Uh, we have artists and other people here, but uh, what difference do you think contemporary art installations in these historic contexts make to visitors? I can oh, I can oh. talk about that a little bit and sure the, Melissa the Sitka Alaska has six hundred thousand people pouring off of cruise ships in the summer now, and they come to this tiny little museum that was built in the turn of the last century, and they adore looking at the artists and residents. And as a matter of fact, we get spontaneous donations from people who are just so fascinated by watching. An Alaska Native person doing Alaska Native crafts or artisanship um, that they just send money because it's they think it's so wonderful. So that that speaks to this, I think, very specifically that people really love seeing that, even though it's not necessarily contemporary art in the sense of modernism. Still contemporary. Uh, somebody else had a thought on that. Uh, I I was about to report just on a conversation that um, Marla and I and other people in our group were having. And um, I was saying coming from a traditional historic site that does have, um, you know, it's a traditional historic site. I always found that the tools of an historic site imply that the past is done and that it's over our understanding of the past is not changing and that what well, you know the tools are you, you know you make a, a sign and hire a graphic designer and put a spotlight hitting the sign and everything just looks like the past is done you know literally the objects are under glass and that history is over our understanding is not going to continue to evolve someone's already figured it out for you here's the message you need to take from it and we and historic sites use that to our advantage a lot to try to craft whatever the narrative is. But, but I find the visitors very rarely question who wrote that sign. And we all know it was just some, someone on a Tuesday afternoon wrote that sign, you know, and then now it's on the wall. But I think visitors don't often even think about how we know what we know, whose voice is represented by that. And artists are often able to cut through that and rather than the institutional voice of God saying, this cell block was built in 1836 and a floor plan by Don Haviland, then an artist comes in and says, you know, here's what I experienced when living in a space like that. Uh, or here's um, here's the reflection of my parents on the murder of their daughter. You know, and just it just slices through with so much more ability to see ourselves um, in that story, see the story as ongoing, seeing that that these patterns continue today, that we're part of it. Um, and Marla, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you had some really interesting reflections on how your site has has fallen outside of that traditional. Not uh, not to imply that 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 your site is even a traditional historic site. Of course, the the, the culture and the of the Osage is still very much here. But I don't want to put you on the spot, Marla. I'd ask oh, if no, you. I, I... Okay. I can just say what I yeah, what please. it said was, as Alex had mentioned, because it is the oldest tribal museum, uh, you know, and it's been around since 1938, and it was founded under our leadership, uh, our last hereditary chief, Chief Fred Lookout, and also our tribal council. The um, the desire was there to um, use the museum as a way to uh, preserve the things that we had left left, but also to articulate our history and our own story. And I think that, you know, uh, Alex had mentioned also the sort of generations of artists. Um, and there are, you know, many families belong to that. And I, I my father was a painter. And, and I think that, you know, they talk about the importance of co-creating. Uh, co 
And so we have these group shows where there will be like one theme in it. And a lot of times, one of the, one of the wonderful things that happens out of that is that you see these through lines of our ancestral values that come through, whether it is, you know, move forward, don't look back, uh, the respect for the order of, order of things or these different things that you'll see, the respect for the drum and this show we had voices from the drum. And then you'll see the different diversity of stories and the diversity of experiences of what that means to individual Osages. And so the other thing that we do in our museum is, you know, we have it's uh, these group shows are intergenerational. We have these established artists, uh, an NEA heritage fellow with a, you know, 15 year old student. So we have these things that, that, um, that do show different generations, do show the um, the different ways in which people will grapple with different ideas. And I think that one of the other things too that I think is important in terms of our museum at its best, you know, we don't always do this, but we try to, is to it's a it's an important space because it because of the history being around for almost a hundred years to be able to articulate our story and use not this, you know, omnipresent old fashioned voice of, you know, you said that people don't question who it is, but if we, you know, we facilitate these um, exhibitions by going out to the community and talking to our head committee men, the cooks and all of the different people that um, shape and are important in our cultural roles. And we get information from them and what they want to see and, and the job of the curators to facilitate that message. And so we can, as a governmental, uh, agency as well for our nation is use the voice of we, and that can be very powerful to talk about about resilience, to talk about the things that have happened in our past, and talk about how we're going to survive into the future. So those are kind of the things that I was uh, talking about in the the room. Great, thanks, Marla, for responding when Sean called you out. Judith, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, I did. It was just two things. Um, um, visitors, just about visitors. I mean. Uh, actually, uh, quite a lot of people who are coming to see heritage and museums get quite upset about placing contemporary art in these uh, revered sort of uh, places of, of history. So um, my role as a, a, as a curator of placing contemporary art practice within uh, heritage and museums sometimes is a difficult, and I know, I, I'm sure I'm probably saying things that people be quite familiar with is it's sometimes a uh, an uncomfortable uh, place you mean you're an inter you know a mediator between uh con conservation and and preservation and pushing and um the boundaries and telling another story um but I just want to bring it back to co-creation I think what I was uh, what we were talking about in our group was the thing about ownership uh of a co-creation piece of, about is it an art you know whose whose work is it when we are talking about co-creation. So I'll throw that question back to the speakers. Um, and I'm gonna say we are almost at the end and I know some people have had to leave already and I appreciate those of you who have stuck with us. Jemima, can you make your point really quickly for me? Also, my name is Jemima, y'all. Um, just correcting, I know it's hard oh, to- Oh, I'm answer. sorry, thank you. Jemima. It's all right, I wanted to, since we were still talking about that point, like about viewers, I really, feel like it helps viewers to keep their focus on the intention of what we're trying to provide with the space. It also shows the dedication that we have within it because, you know, with a historical space looking like a historical space, whoever occupies that space can, you know, tell whatever story they would like in that space. So if the space is changed with how it looks, I feel like it really allows things to happen differently, addresses that loophole and really upsets the space. I was showing my group this one story I made of this guy, he had the idea of wanting to go through the process of manumission. So I wanted to self-purchase his freedom. He works hard for it, um, but then he was still ultimately denied. That's great, thank you. And I'm gonna give our speakers um, final words, um, reflecting on anything you wanna reflect about. <laughs> that you heard today or that it made you think about. Alex, I'm going to start with you. Well, I'm just really grateful that we're all, you know, working in areas of uh, thoughtful awareness of our histories and of the power that art can do to change things, to help people, to heal people and be in service to others. And I just um, 
just want to say thank you all in in peace <laughs> and free Palestine. Terrific. Thank you. Alex, Tanu, you want to give any share any final thoughts? I mean, uh, I'm really glad like to participate in this platform. Like, and thank you, Linda, very much, like uh, for, for organizing this thing. And it is really important for me uh, to get to know like uh, more people are like working in this like similar things. That that is really important. Like, and also like Sean and like Al like Alex and like has like done incredible job. Like, so it is really nice to see their work and see the different perspectives. And though it's a like co-creation work, like it can be different in so many aspects. Uh, that's one of the important learning that I'm, I'm getting from here. And also like, I'd love to like carry on these conversations like in future so that like um, this learning process is like ongoing because like knowledge is something, it is always important to like get like from uh, like really knowledgeable people like you all here, like you're connecting. And uh, this is also very inspirational, like for me, because uh, for me, like I'm like working just with like this Rohingya refugee context for a while. But like, I know, like we develop like such a like great method, like that we can work like actually in any kind of communities, like all over the world, like with implying these similar effects, like a similar method of work. And I think like it is really important to uh, be connected with each other and uh, yeah like I'd love to know more more about like different work like and be connected like with you all thank you well there's certainly more to come right Judith and Rebecca Sean your thoughts it's just such a great honor and a, and just a joy to be in community with all of you from around the world this morning thank you and um especially to be uh, among my co-panelists um doing such extraordinary work um I think that we often think of artists as being somehow different than the rest of us, but um, I think we've seen a lot of examples today that more people have, um, that the creative process unlocks storytelling in all sorts of ways and doesn't have to be a traditional person who identifies themselves as an artist, but could be all sorts of folks who have poetry and beauty and reflection and, um, and, just um, extraordinary observations that they can express to the world, even if they don't consider themselves an artist. So, um, and thank you all for 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 joining us this morning, and especially to the to the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, my old friends, um, doing such extraordinary work. It's one of the great joys of coalition work is bringing people together. That's that's really what we do is bring people together to think about what we do. Uh, and so this was wonderful. We are real quick gonna put up, a, we do a little survey at the end of any kind of webinar we do, and we're gonna put that up, um, but we'll also probably email it to you as well. Um, but you can do from a QR code. This is how you can find me. I can connect you with anybody else. Um, and as well, how you can find us on X, Instagram and Facebook. Um, if you're interested in learning more about what we do. And we'll certainly be in touch with all of you about the next gatherings of, of um, these conversations, the next meetup, the call for artist residencies. I know a number of you are artists, so you may be particularly interested. We'll make sure you get that. Um, and again, thank you all so much for joining. Have a good day, evening, morning, whatever it is, all of you. Thanks and a lot. Thank you, you too. Thanks, Linda. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you.